Hey guys, this is Ed with the Kaizen Effect. If you haven't heard yet, I just released a super awesome course over at Udemy, which you should check out. The course covers a lot of topics we'll be discussing in today's video, such as calculus of variations and Lagrangian mechanics. And I also show you how to put all those skills to use by developing simulations, which are similar to those powering your favorite video games and animated movies. Super cool stuff, guys. But in today's video, what we're gonna do, we're gonna go through the second quiz in that course. So if you like what you see and you want more, make sure you check out my Udemy course. Right now, we're offering a 20% limited discount. So if you're interested, now's the best time to buy because I don't know how long I'd be offering this discount and I'd like my supporters to get the best price possible on the course. So I look forward to working with you and uh, enjoy the video. Hey guys, this is Ed with the Kaizen Effect. Today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take all your knowledge in Lagrangian mechanics, calculus of variations, and in essence, classical physics, and we're gonna finally put it to use. We're gonna run through an example problem. And today, the one we're gonna focus on is actually uh, the second quiz in my Udemy course that I just put out. So if you have not checked that out, make sure you check it out. I put a lot of time into that course, and I would love to have you inside the course and help you as much as possible. However, focusing on the topic at hand, the problem we're going to run through is whoosh, the sliding rope problem, which is depicted as follows. Now, I think this problem is absolutely awesome for explaining Lagrangian mechanics and practicing its, its mechanics, uh, what it entails, and how to actually use it practically because if you recall one of my previous videos, I gave you an infallible recipe for approaching any Lagrangian mechanics problem, okay? But what I caution is I don't like doing that, giving out a recipe because it trains students to fall into a plug and chug mentality. And I think this is very dangerous because it trains you to confide more in my integrity, somebody else's integrity, wisdom, experience, and what they have to offer as opposed to trusting your own into it and having confidence in approaching problems and getting solutions. Because if you trust in somebody else's intuition more than your own, when you're running through the problem, you're gonna start questioning things. Well, why are we doing it this way? Um, uh, where did this come from? You're not gonna feel comfortable. You're not gonna feel certain with the direction you're heading towards. And that's problematic and leads to a lot of mistakes because again, you're not present in the problem, right? You're not present, you're not thinking critically about it. And I try to encourage students not to do that, to derive things, to be present, to take their experiences. You know, you're more wise than you think. You have a lot of knowledge in physics and you should actually be applying that and trusting it more than somebody else. Don't blindly follow things just because of faith, right? Know why things are, take that knowledge and act upon it. So I think this problem is, absolutely essential for defeating that kind of idea because you can work through the recipe I gave you in that video, but in each step, you're forced to think about how to actually apply it. It's not as straightforward, and we're gonna see this especially with the potential energy terms and kinetic energy terms. So, word of caution. I'm gonna run through the recipe I provided in one of my previous videos, which explains what kind of path you can take to always get to it as a solution? It's like an infallible kind of approach. However, don't follow these blindly and try to think through each step, okay? And you're gonna be challenged to do that in this particular problem. So let's go over this recipe, let's review it, and then let's apply it. So the main idea of any kind of Lagrangian mechanics problem is, again, we're going to apply Hamilton's principle. We're gonna say if we have any kind of object and we apply some kind of force, we wanna move it, we want to have the system evolve with time, it has a ton of paths it can take and go like that, go it can go and do whatever it wants in essence. So what Hamilton's principle says, it says, okay, we know there are an infinite number of paths this particle or object can take, this system can evolve into. What we're gonna do is we're going to restrict those paths specifically down to the one path 
that conforms to the laws of the universe. What am I talking about here? I'm talking about the conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. And that second conservation law, that's Newton's uh, second law, right? F equals ma, right? That gives us our equation of motion, all the information we need to determine how a system is going to evolve, what an object is going to do, so on and so forth. So what this says is that we're going to take all those solutions, we're going to restrict it down to that one path that conforms to all of our conservation laws, and that that kind of approach is able, we're, we're able to achieve that approach by saying, we're going to take our functionale of our system, which is shown as follows, which is defined in terms of all of our generalized coordinates, Q sub n, you know, Q sub 1, Q sub 2, Q sub 3, or x, y, z, for example. And what we're going to do is we're going to minimize this functionale. If we define the Lagrangian L appropriately, that functionale is going to yield us those paths I was talking about, um, which conform to the conservation laws of the universe, okay? That's the general approach of Hamilton's principle. So when you hear minimize a function, that should make you think of calculus, and in particular calculus of variations because we're dealing with, whoosh, you know, a functionale. That's why we spent so much time developing your calculus of variation skills so you can speak this language. And what you learn is that when you want to find stationary points or minimize this functionale, what do you do? What do you do? I know you know it. Tell me. You apply the Euler-Lagrange equation, right? That's going to give us stationary points to this guy. And if we define this, as I showed in my previous videos, that's going to restrict our path to the one path that conforms to our conservation laws. And we're getting our equation of motion exactly what we want in the problem, okay? So that's the name of the game. That's what we're going to do. We're going to follow Hamilton's principle, the principle of least action. And if you don't feel comfortable with what I just ran through, you can check out my video here. I run through that concept. I explain where the Lagrangian comes from. And it'll clear up any confusion you have. So now let's run through the recipe. How do we actually apply Hamilton's principle? Well, the way in which we do that is one. First, we determine the degrees of freedom, or we define the coordinate system. In essence, we need to figure out how this particle is going to move through space, and we want to track that at every point in time. What I'm talking about from a broad example is we want to define x, y, and z if we're in the Cartesian coordinate system, or you know, polar coordinates are theta z, right? We want to figure out how those coordinates are going to evolve with time because if we know that, then we could figure out the values at each point in time and that will allow us to track where the particle or system is at any given time t, okay? So once we get the generalized coordinates, um, that's going to tell us how many equations of motion we're going to need, right? Because, um, Let's say we have a system defined by three coordinates. We're going to have to figure out how those coordinates evolve with time. Hence, we're going to need an equation of motion for each one. And hence, we're going to have to solve those equations of motion for each coordinate we're considering. Okay? In essence, it constrains our problem. It constrains it. It allows us to define it. Once we get that, next what we do is we calculate the T, the kinetic energy, and the U, potential energy. And then we plug that into, well, bam, our Lagrangian. Lagrangian is equal to T minus U. This is how the functionale is defined such that we can restrict our paths to the appropriate paths that we want, the ones that follow what nature dictates. Okay? So once we get that, um, it's pretty much smooth sailing henceforth, right? What we have to do is we have to derive the Lagrange's equation for each coordinate or degree of freedom as follows. So for each coordinate, each generalized coordinate we have, what we're going to have, we're going to have this equation here. This is basically the Euler-Lagrange equation, which minimizes this guy and hence allows us to apply Hamilton's principle, right? So we're going to get this guy um, for each coordinate that's going to serve as our equation of motion, all the information we need regarding a system or any kind of object. And then the final step of the recipe is to number four, solve the ODE or PDE. We're going to take that equation of motion. We're going to... We'll see if we can come up with an analytical solution. If we can't find an analytical solution, we can find a computational solution, okay? Which I delve into a lot in my, in my Udemy course. You can check that out if you want. Um, ask me any questions if you, you're unclear about that. But in this problem, we're going to find that we can actually solve it analytically, which is super cool, okay? So this is the general recipe you can follow to infallibly get a solution 
any Lagrangian mechanics problem. And what I want you to do is, if you apply this, don't apply it blindly. Confide in your intuition, not mine, okay? This is a product of my insight, of my learning, my experiences. If you confide in this and follow it blindly, as opposed to trusting what you have to offer, you have a lot to offer. You have a lot to offer, don't doubt that. You know, you're not gonna have confidence in applying each step. You're gonna make mistakes and you don't wanna do that, okay? So trust in your intuition, follow these, be present in each step. And if you wanna modify it, go ahead. I encourage you to do that. But this should be, if you're super confused, you need some kind of approach to use to even start the problem, this is the guy you wanna use, okay? So now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this, whoosh, this recipe I just threw at you once again, and we're gonna actually apply it. We're gonna take your classical uh, physics experience, your Lagrangian mechanics, your calculus of variations, put it to good use, and consider the example that we want to consider in this video. All right, let's do just that. Let's run through the problem and make use of your Lagrangian mechanics and calculus of variation skills you developed with me. All right, so what's the problem? What is the problem we're gonna be analyzing today? This is the problem of the sliding rope. So in essence, what we're gonna have, we're gonna have some rope, could be any kind of rope, um, lying off the edge of a table. And initially, we're going to be holding it. Um, we're going to say that at time t equals zero, or y sub zero, we're going to have half the length of this guy, which is length L, hanging over the table, so L over two. And we're gonna assume that initially, its velocity, or y prime, is zero. In essence, it's at rest because we're holding it, right? So those are our initial conditions. And we're gonna have this, this rope. It's gonna have a total mass of m, and we're gonna assume, this is an important assumption, that the density of this rope is uniform. That means that we don't have a lot of mass concentrated maybe down here or down there or at different locations along the rope. It's going to be distributed whoosh, evenly, okay? And that's gonna be an, an important uh, assumption we have when calculating the potential energy, which I'll get to eventually. So what we're gonna do is we're going to set our origin at the surface of this guy at the top, and we're going to track how this guy falls off of the table. What kind of motion is it going to experience? Is it going to be exponential? Is it going to be a constant velocity? We don't really know, so we're gonna investigate that and figure out a bit more. Um, the variable we're going to use to run through this, to track the motion is going to be y, and we're going to define it as a function of t. Now, the first step of our recipe is what? We wanna figure out our generalized coordinates. So the question I ask, have to ask you is, how many coordinates do we need to track the motion of this particle, or this system, this rope in essence? So I sort of gave it away there. I'll let you think about that for a bit. So you should be thinking we only need one variable, right, one coordinate, because if we can track the bottom of this, and we assume it's not going to sway back and forth or into the board and out of the board, or assume it's going to fall straight down, then we only need one variable. We need to calculate the vertical distance from our surface, right, our origin that we're gonna select, okay? So we're gonna have one degree of freedom, one coordinate, and that means Waiting for it, I'm waiting for it, tell me. That means we're gonna have one Lagrange's equation, one equation of motion, right? Because we have to figure out how one variable, how one coordinate evolves as time progresses, okay? So that's all we have uh, for step one of our recipe. Once we know the generalized coordinate, what do we wanna do? We wanna start figuring out um, essential quantities of the system. I'm talking about the kinetic energy T and the potential energy U, okay? So once we get that, we can plug it into our Lagrangian, and then start getting our equation of motion. So, as I was saying previously, this is going to be the challenging part of the problem, which really forces you to think about what you're doing in applying this generalized infallible recipe, okay? So, the first thing we're going to focus on is going to be the hard component. The hard component here is going to be the potential energy. So, when you look at this, we're gonna see that initially, we only have a certain amount of mass below the surface. However, as this thing moves down and down and down, more mass is going to enter the system below the surface that we're gonna to have to 
figure out potential energy for. So it's not like what we're used to seeing in fabricated physics problems in which we have some kind of point mass, you know, some concentrated mass in which we could say, okay, it's just MGH. Simple. We have to consider an entire object. We have to consider the distribution of mass throughout the object, which is why I said we're going to have a uniform distribution. And it's not really clear where the CG is going to be. Is the CG going to be constant? Is it going to change? Can we track the CG? There are a lot of questions here. So let's consider them and let's break it down and start thinking about this using our intuition, our experience, and I guess dive straight into it, okay? So there are two methods you can use to figure out the potential energy. I'm gonna start with the hard method first because the other method sort of builds off this method. And what I'm gonna say is, I'm gonna draw another depiction here. I'm gonna say, let's say we have the origin here that's gonna represent the top surface of the table and we have this rope hanging down, okay? And at any point T, it's going to have a center of mass or center of gravity um, that is going to change, right? Because if we add mass to this, as the sky falls, this is going to move down. We're going to get more mass below the origin. And this guy is going to move based upon how much mass we have, right? So what we want to do is we want to say, okay, each elevation change of this rope is going to have a different potential energy, right? Because potential energy U is equal to M G Y, or the force of gravity times Y, the distance below this origin, right? So this mass, we can have a guy right here, this small infinitesimal mass. This is going to have a different mass then, or it's going to have a different potential energy than that guy, right? Because the Y portion changed. So thinking about that, just what I, what I just said there, it makes you think that each infinitesimal element is going to have a different potential energy, so we're going to have to consider it separately, okay? So when I say infinitesimal elements, they're going to have different potential energies, and I further elaborate that we want the total potential energy. What does that make you think of? What red flag does that raise? That raises a red flag for calculus, and in particular, the integral. So the game plan we want to do or we want to use here is we're going to figure out the potential energy of each individual segment or each infinitesimal segment along this rope and then we're going to add up all of those elements okay so that's done using the integral the first thing we want to do if we want to add up all those individual elements the first appropriate thing to consider is to say okay well in order to add them all up i need to figure out what the infinitesimal potential energy is of that infinitesimal element or that small element. If infinitesimal makes you feel uncomfortable, just think of a very small element that uh, does not have like, it's not like an object. It's sort of like a point mass, but infinitesimal. Okay. So what we need to do first is figure out how to define one of those elements. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to blow up one of these elements. I'm going to assume it's right there. Like we're going to get a sliver like that. It's so small you can't even see any kind of length change there. So if I blow that up, we're gonna have something like this, okay? And it's so small that the CG is essentially right there. So we can keep track of that guy. We can come down, we get a Y to the center of mass of this infinitesimal, or center of gravity of this infinitesimal element, okay? And it's gonna be very small, but the thickness is sort of like dy, okay? Very small change in y. And this mass of this element, we have to figure out what that is. Now, this is where um, my notion of saying that we have a uniform distribution comes into play here, right? Because what we're going to say is, if it has a uniform distribution, we can have a linear density. Right? That's usually represented as lambda. Okay? And then if we know lambda, we can say, okay, um, the total mass, we can add up from zero to the total y, or the bottom of our rope that we're keeping track of. We can add up all these little elements 
lambda. Well, that's a terrible lambda. Let's repeat that. So lambda um, dy. And since it's a linear density, it's like mass divided by length. So mass divided by length times the length. We're adding all those elements up. That gives us the total mass. That's the name of the game here. But we have to figure out what this guy is. Well, what we can say is, if we know the total mass, and we know the total length, why not divide the total mass by the total length? Makes sense, right? We're getting an even distribution here. So we're going to define this as m divided by l. So what happens is, our total mass, when we, we consider the case this got all the way below the surface, you know, starting from here, we have the total length, so this would be 0 to L. This would be M over L times L, after you do the integration, we get the total mass of our object, okay? So that works out well. Um, so we could take my eraser, erase this, and say M over L, okay? So we're making good progress. We know what the mass is of this individual element. Now we need to figure out what the infinitesimal potential energy is going to be. Figure out what this element, what kind of potential energy it has. So we're going to call the infinitesimal potential energy du, and we're going to say, okay, um, well, this is going to be the mass of the element times g times the distance, this, this guy here, the distance from the origin that this infinitesimal mass is. So we'll call that y. It's the distance down to this guy. Um, if it confuses you, this y here, it's a little different than that y. I'll call it y bar. The y distance to the center of gravity, center of mass of this guy, to that point. Okay. So all we need to do now is just plug stuff in, right? stuff in. Well, you know, this n element, this is just this guy here, m over l dy, right? y bar. Okay? So, we need to back up here. In a lot of my previous videos, what I said was that the potential energy is a result of our work term. And our work term is the negative integral of f dot dr. In essence, this tells us how the work, how the force that is applied to an object moves it, what kind of work that translates into. Because if you take this, I use that force, I did some work. I had to use some calories that I ate, right? So, we have this negative sign in front of here for conservative forces, and this allows us to get the correct sign, because if I do this, some energy left my body to do work on this guy, and it should be um, negative. We took the potential energy I had from the calories, we used it to create some motion, something useful, and it was applied to the system. Now, in the case of the force of gravity, if we have the origin at the top of the table, and it's falling below the table, we're taking the potential energy it had to sit on top of that table, we're converting it to kinetic energy, right? And that conversion takes energy out of the system, right? So you'd expect your potential energy to be negative, right? Because it changed. du is going to be negative. If it's above, we have to work against the force of gravity, so we put energy into the system, it becomes positive. We're getting more potential energy, right? So this, this formula here helps incorporate that philosophy into the mathematics and guide our intuition. So if we think about the vectors, we have a force of gravity, mg, going down. And in this case, dr, the distance it moved, was down. So these guys are parallel. And the angle between them is 0. Cosine 0 is 1. This guy is a positive, we get the negative. Jives well with our intuition, we get that negative potential energy, right? So that's how we get the sign 
we're taking the energy that's stored in this rope and we're converting it into the, the kinetic energy. So the potential energy, what? Goes down, right? It's gonna go down. So we need a negative in here. And we're going to maintain that, okay? So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna get rid of this bar, which make, might make you guys feel a little uncomfortable, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, as this guy, as we, we change Y from the origin to the tip where we want it to, we're gonna consider this point here, this point here, this point there, this point there, this point there, this point there, so on and so forth, you get the idea. We're gonna consider du here, du there, du there, and we're gonna add them all up, and when we get to the bottom of this guy, what's gonna happen? We're gonna have the total connect, uh, potential energy, right? That's the name of the game here. So, to do that, we can integrate, right? We can integrate from the top at y equals zero, to the bottom, which we're tracking as y, that's what our y is defined as, and that's why we actually define it as such. So what we can say is, okay, I'm going to add up all these potential energy terms, and that's done by integrating from zero to the point y here. Uh, you know, this is actually a little confusing, so I'm going to change this back to y bars, because in essence, we're, we're sort of, it, it really doesn't matter what variable we use, but I think this is more consistent, might help you guys understand a bit better if you're confused. Send me an email, ask me a question, send a uh, comment below, and I'll clear it up for you, okay? So, what we have is we have the negative um, n over L, and we're gonna have this, this guy right here after the G, y bar, and then dy bar. So, we're adding up all these guys, we're adding up all the infinitesimal potential energies to get the total. So when we integrate this, we get negative mg, so y, dy, that integral is y squared over two. I'm gonna put the two down here. And we end up with y squared after we put in the y term there, okay? So that's going to be our u term. And as you can see, I like this problem a lot because it really forces you to think about the potential energy terms, the kinetic energy terms. You can't just say, I saw this recipe this guy gave me. I'm gonna apply it. I'm gonna trust his intuition more than mine. No, I'm gonna trust my intuition. I'm gonna say, hey, I gotta think about this. Why, why is this as such? How do I get the potential energy? What kind of ingenious approach can I think of to analyze this? See, you have to think through this. You gotta use your wisdom. You gotta use your experience, and I love that. It forces you to think, it forces you to be a physicist, right? So this is an excellent, excellent problem. So that's how you can get the potential energy. And I guess I'll write it right here on the side. So our U is going to be negative mg over 2L y squared. All right, so I said there's a hard approach we could take, calculate that, and there's also an easy approach. So we tackled the hard approach, Let's um, tackle the easy approach, okay? So what's the easy approach? The easy approach is to use, I think it's more of like an engineering approach in the sense that we're using pre-established ideas. And again, again, I caution you from using this kind of method because, because you know, you're confiding in somebody else's intuition. You don't know the assumptions associated with that derivation. So you can use these results that I'm gonna to present to you, but I'm going to derive them such that you know where they came from, so that you have the background, so that you know the assumptions, so that you understand the problem a bit more, okay? So obviously, what you could have done is, you could have said, okay, I have this, this object below the origin, and you know what, it has a CG. What if I know that CG beforehand? What if I know how it changes? What if I can keep track of that, and through knowledge of that, calculate the potential energy in an easier manner, right? That would be a good idea, right? Why not? That's awesome, man. So that's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna show you how to calculate this um, center of gravity in essence. So if you look it up in your book, you probably get a result. Maybe you can think of what it's going to be for this particular object. But if we have a circular object, maybe a we're gonna model this rope as a cylinder of radius r. 
and it's going to be um, 360 degrees, our cylinder, right? So if you want to find CG, and you're using this as your reference origin, I'll call this Z bar, what you need to do is you need to take or compute something which is known as an expectation value. The simple way to think about this is it's an average. It's an average. It's what we would expect to get based upon our data we have. So the most, uh, I think the closest example of this that you guys have is probably the average on test scores when you're taking exams, right? When you want to compute the average, right? Your average is the sum of the number of tests with a given score times your score over the sum of your total tests. Right? We're trying to figure out the probability that you get a certain score, the highest probability. That, that's like the average. So when you get this, you sort of say, oh, it's not right, but just looking at the math, it's like, oh, we're canceling these guys, we get the average score, which I could represent as that. This is what we're going to do. We're going to do this. We're going to do this with um, the position, the z position. What is the average z position of my distributed mass? That's essentially what we're going to do. So in this case, we can use the, the mass as sort of like, um, like the, is it the test score? Yeah, like our test scores, the number of test scores. And the z component is the expected value we want. That's like the score, right? So we can get something like this, z bar. Um, we'll call this zcg. And there's a reason why I'm using z. We'll get to that in a second. So z bar is just going to be, well, you know what? We can add up all these infinitesimal masses multiply it by their distance from the origin, take that sum, or a sum over i, for all those infinitesimal elements, and then we can just add up the masses over i to get the total mass, right? That's something we could do. So we can further define this guy out a bit. i, we can say the total mass is big M, okay? So, what we want to do is we could say, okay, well, you know what? This is sort of like an integral, right? If we sum stuff up, that makes you think of an integral. And we can have an infinitesimal mass, right? So we can figure out the distance to that infinitesimal mass and just say, I'm going to integrate that guy, right? So this becomes z dm, the distance, the infinitesimal mass, and then we add up whoosh, along the entire length, right? And then we divide by the total mass. So this is how you could figure out the expectation value or the center of mass, center of gravity. That's since we're doing the same thing we do in a class environment for an average, right? We're doing the same thing. We're taking the number of um, the concentration of particles, which is translated into the mass, which have this given height, and then we're dividing by the total concentration. So this is not right, don't do this, but just looking at it, it's like, oh, we're canceling the mass. Not quite right, but that's a general, <laughs> I guess, behind the scenes way of looking at it, if it makes you feel comfortable. Um, and then we get the ex expectation value of z. So let's actually do this for the, the guy we have here. So it's a cylinder that makes you think, what kind of coordinate system do I want? What coordinate system do I want? Polar coordinates, right? That's what we want to get. So this becomes um, this guy here, 1 over m. I'm going to pull out that big m. And we're going to have a triple integral. In essence, dm, dm is going to be... Um, Right? We could take the density, we're going to call it rho, we can integrate over volume, this is going to be mass divided by volume, figure out the volume of that infinitesimal element, and that's going to give us our infinitesimal mass. Right? That's how we usually do things here. 
So we could take this and we can say, we're gonna take our triple integral and we're gonna get this guy. And then we're gonna multiply by our z, that guy there, and let's plug in dm, which is the row dv. So the polar coordinates is dr, r d theta, dz. So if you think about this, you know, this is going to be r, this is going to be like our d theta, and r d theta, that's like r sine theta, because the Terra series of sine is going to be theta plus all these extra terms squared, and if it's very small, which is d theta, all those extra terms are squared, uh, I think it's something to a fourth. Uh, I don't know the exact uh, exponent. I probably should have checked that out. But the main idea here is that if you square a small term, it becomes infinitesimally small, so on and so forth. So they could be neglected, and we only take the theta, which is d theta. So this is like um, this portion here, right? So when we multiply them together, that's going to give us our area. And then whoosh, we pull this guy out. That's like dz. That's multiplying by like that length, and um, yeah, that gives us our, our area that we want. That's the area of our, our element, okay? You guys probably know that, but some little background on that. So what we wanna do, we want to integrate from zero to r, go all the way out, zero to r, zero to two pi, or d theta, and zero to l, the entire length of this guy that is hanging under here, okay? So um, what we need to do is we need to figure out what this is. Well, we know the volume of a cylinder, right? That's pi r squared, the area of the circle, the top, and then whoosh, times L. So we're taking the area, whoosh, distributing it along the length, right? Area, whoosh, whoosh, sweeping it through. That gives us our, our volume. So this guy, is sort of like the total mass divided by the volume, which is pi r squared times L, okay? Um, we're gonna use the total mass in this case, so it's a big M, such that we can work with that guy, right? So this becomes one over big M, zero r, zero two pi, zero, L, big M over pi, R squared, L, so on and so forth. Z, I'm going to pull the R in, dr, d theta, dz, okay? So once we get some board space, uh, I'm going to continue this up here. So this just becomes, it, this is easy, right? This guy is going to cancel with that guy. Well, the R becomes R squared over 2. Okay. So we get, I'll just pull the, the uh, constants out. Well, we could plug in big R because the 0 is going to cancel. So we get big R squared over 2. That's that guy. Theta, we just get a variable. So we get 2 pi times this guy. The integral of z is z squared over 2. And the l is going to be that. So we get l squared over 2. The 2's are going to cancel. Pi's are going to cancel. R squares are going to cancel. This l is going to cancel with that. And what we're left with is not exciting. Just an l over 2. Um, so you should have expected it to be l over 2. This is why we get this result, is the center of mass, and the L is going to be defined as the distance from the origin to the bottom of that guy. We want to figure out what the center of gravity is with respect to just this portion, okay? So now we can figure out the center of gravity. We know it's the length over two, and we have to question, well, how does that relate to my problem at hand? Well, the, the problem at hand we have, we're taking y to be the bottom portion of this rope. So 
y is sort of like our L. So we can say that our center of gravity is equal to y over 2, right? At any point in time, right? So as time progresses, this guy's going to slide down. But still, we're going to have y below the surface of the table. If we divide it by 2, it'll find us the center of gravity. So it's sort of like an adaptive center of gravity. And again, this is why we're defining the bottom of this guy to be y, right? That's uh, what we're doing here. So we got the CG. We can consider the potential energy, right? So once we know this guy here, we know that we can say the total U of that guy is the total mass, M, total mass. Well, actually, we need to back up. We need to back up. Um, we need the mass of this guy, right? The mass of that guy. So we, we saw previously that this is just um, the integral of m over l dy, right? dy. And we go from 0 to y. Right? We're adding up each distribution along this guy. That's intuitive. We don't even need the integration, but I'm going to put that in there just to be mathematically correct. Um, so we got that guy. That's the m. This is our g. And then we have, you know what? I'm going to call this ycg just to make sure we don't confuse anybody who's running through this. I used ZCG because we were dealing with um, polar coordinates, right? And you usually have a, a Z, not a Y. So you don't want to confuse anybody there. So we're going to switch back to our Y coordinates, and we want the Y to the CG. Okay? So this, in essence, what we're doing is we're concentrating. We're going to say the mass is concentrated at the CG, like a uh, point mass, and then we're going to proceed. So this gives us, well, we already got this. This is m over l times y times g times, we'll plug this guy in, y over 2. Let's simplify. See what happens. mg over 2l. y squared. And again, it's going to be negative for the reasons I explained previously, because we're taking energy out of the system, potential energy out of the system to convert it into kinetic energy. Or you could use the mathematical framework I explained previously, which will not fail you. Because it incorporates the philosophy into the math, the mathematical products. So again, bam, that's what we get. Bam, we compare it to that guy. Guess what? Uh, they're the same. So you could use this, this different approach, and you could look up CGs and tables. I caution you from doing that because you can make mistakes. Maybe your object is different from the CG they calculated. Uh, you want to be very cautious. I don't like following things blindly, and I do not encourage you to do so. That's why I showed you how to actually derive this simple CG calc. It's not super hard, very straightforward, but I wanted you to know where this is coming from. So we got the U guy, and all that's left is really just to um, figure out the kinetic energy. Right? That's all we need. So, spend a lot of time on the potential energy because it's not straightforward. And again, I like that because it makes you think through the recipe I gave you. Don't follow it blindly. Now what we want to do is we want to consider kinetic energy T. We know that the kinetic energy is always defined as one half times the mass of the system times the velocity of the system. Now the key thing we want to realize here is that this guy does not stretch it's sort of like a rigid rod, even though it's not. That's an assumption we're using, okay? So the reason why I want to make that assumption is because we want to say that every point mass incorporated into this rope, every mass along the length of this rope is going to have the same velocity. All right? It's not stretching, so this one point is moving faster than the other point. No, we're not going to deal with that. We're going to assume it's, it's solid. So if we do that, what we can say is that if we take this guy, the bottom, bottom portion of the rope, if that moves really fast, that portion, or if it moves at a velocity y dot, the derivative of y, 
This also has to move at that same velocity. This point also has to move at the same velocity. That point also has to move at the same velocity. So what we can say is we're going to treat this as an object, a full mass, and we're going to track the velocity of the center of gravity. So we can say one half times the total mass times the velocity of that CG. We know we're trying to keep track of the bottom portion, so that applies to everything else, and we get the following. Okay, so the kinetic, kinetic energy, it took a little bit of thought, not as hard as the potential energy, but that's what we got. So at this point, we've got all the ingredients we need to really tackle this problem. Now we want to plug it into our nice framework of Lagrangian mechanics, employ Hamilton's principle, and proceed with the problem. And before we do that, we want to take a sip of green tea because green tea is awesome. Okay, so let's make use of all the hard work we just, we just had. We spent a lot of time driving these, these quantities. So what we want to do is define the Lagrangian. Define the Lagrangian. All right, guys? So Lagrangian, which is defined such that when we find stationary points to our function m of Hamilton's principle, they're going to conform our paths that we follow to the conservation laws of the universe. Okay? So that was defined as t minus u in one of my previous videos. Doesn't look familiar? Check out one of my previous videos. I explain it very well. So all I want to do is take these guys, bam, bam, plug them into here. So we get one half m y dot squared minus this guy. So the u has a negative. That becomes a positive mg over 2l y squared. Bam. We got the Lagrangian. We spent all that time, all that energy learning Lagrangian mechanics, calculus of variations, and we got this Lagrangian. So this has all the information we need to figure out how the system is going to evolve with time. We just need to do operations to that, and that's what we're going to do shortly. All right, let's finally take all these elements we worked so diligently to derive and actually put them into the rest of our formula, the rest of our recipe, and wrap this problem up. Okay, so we got the Lagrangian, which contains all the information we need to solve this problem. What are we gonna do next? What we are going to do is we're gonna take this and we're going to apply Hamilton's principle by using the Euler-Lagrange equation. So in essence, we're going to find the Lagrange's equation for the only variable we have to consider. The variable we're considering is the y term that is becoming a path variable using the language of calculus of variations. So that means that our Lagrange's equation becomes the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to our path variable y is equal to the normal ordinary derivative with respect to our independent variable t time. And then the derivative, uh, we're taking the derivative of the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the first derivative of our path variable. So it's not a q, it's a y, so y dot. So if we compute that using this guy, basically all these terms using that guy, we can plug them in and then we'll have a direction ahead. We'll get our equation of motion and we can wrap this baby up. So let's uh, compute this guy first. So the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to y well, we look at this guy, we find all terms with y, and all the other terms are constants. So this y dot is a constant. That first term, knock that guy out of the equation, and we have to take the derivative on this guy. So we take the derivative of y squared, that is 2y. We get mg over l, because that 2 canceled with the 2 that comes down, times y. So that's the first term we're going to use for that guy. Next, what we need to do is we need to compute the partial derivative with respect to y dot. So let's do that guy. That guy 
what we could do is we come up to our Lagrangian, we find terms with y dot, all other terms are going to be constants, so you know, this guy has a y, that's treated as a constant, the derivative of a constant is zero. So we only have to consider this guy. Again, it's a y dot squared, so that becomes 2y dot, and that's going to cancel that. So we get this m y dot. Make note, this is like mass times velocity. It's sort of like momentum, as I noted in my previous videos. So when we take the ordinary derivative with respect to time, not surprisingly, m is a constant, and we get our ma term. right? So it sort of looks like we're applying f equals ma here. And this is a tangible um, realization of that fact. Okay. So that becomes my double dot. And all we have to do is take all this chunk and throw it into that equation, our uh, equation of motion, the results from Hamilton's principle, and then we get everything we need, pretty much. So the derivative with respect to y is mg over L times y. And that is equal to um, m y double dot. Now, whenever you get any result from Lagrangian mechanics, what I like to do is whoosh, bounce it off of my intuition, right? Because if it jives well with my intuition, most likely it's correct. We want an extra step, an extra filter to get rid of erroneous things that we do, right? Because people make mistakes, I make mistakes, you make mistakes. You're going to make mistakes sometimes, but if you develop a track record of finding those mistakes and knock them out of your derivation, your solutions, your equations of motion before you actually go and solve that, it's going to keep you on track and uh, help you get the right result, right? So looking at this, we can say, okay, this, this seems to make sense. In the end, we would have F equals MA. Here's our MA term. This has units of force, right? Because the Y cancels with the L, we have an MG, that's the force of gravity, so we get force equals MY double dot. Similarly, we could have solved this problem in Newtonian mechanics by noting that, okay, we could treat this rope as a system, the mass it has is the mass hanging off this table that's pulling it, well, that is the mass M over L times Y, right? That distance, times our linear density, m over l, that gives us our total mass, times g, that's a force of gravity, that's pulling this guy down, okay? So as this guy drops further off the table, what happens is the more mass that's hanging off, that's pulling this, creates a greater force, that's going to create a greater acceleration. So just intuitively, we would think our solution to be exponential. That's what our intuition is telling us. Um, let's actually go ahead, solve this problem, and see if our intuition is right, if it's uh, functioning properly, or if we're idiots. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so I'm just checking here. I got the correct solution. Um, not solution, the equation of motion. What I'm going to do is I'm going to simplify this down a bit more. To get rid of terms we don't want to consider, we can get rid of that n and erase the ingredients that we don't need anymore. And take this equation of motion, write it up here, so we get y double dot is equal to g over l times y. That is what governs what we're going to do. That is the formula we're going to use figuring out the motion here, and all we need to do is solve this. So first things first, um, looking at the equation of motion, you know, it's pretty straightforward. It's the second derivative, and it's equal to that guy. It's, it's linear, very nice, uh, and for that reason, it, we could solve it. We could solve this. It follows a general um, general framework that we've established in an ordinary differential equations class. But if you have not taken ODEs, I'm going to run through it fully. So, solve this, you have to question the following. If we take a function y, 
and we take the derivative twice, what do we end up with? Um, this says we're going to end up with the same function with constants in front. What function does that? Think about that for a second. The exponential function, right? The exponential function. So the exponential function, when we differentiate e to the x, we get e to the x. When we differentiate e to the rx, we get r e to the rx. So we get the same function, possibly with constants in front. So the name of the game with differential equations is you want to come up with a framework, a general structure of the final solution, and you want to fill in the details. So it's like erecting a building. First you put up a scaffold around the general shape of it, it doesn't have a lot of details, and then you fill in the details. You start putting the bricks, the walls, maybe the piping, um, and you start defining it a bit more, right? And in the end, after you define it fully, you have this nice beautiful building, this nice solution, this nice end product. Differential equations is no different. What you do is, you assume a general shape, a general solution, or rather, using the metaphor we're going to use in this problem is we put up our scaffold of the general solution we want, the general end product we want. So we're going to say y sub t is going to be, it's going to be some exponential function. We're going to put in a general characteristic. We're going to say, you know what, the derivative, it's going to change somewhat differently. So we're going to say we're going to have an r up there, and maybe we have a constant in here. So you can see we have this general framework, general scaffold, and we have details we need to fill in. We need to build the solution in essence, like we're building a building, right? We need to figure out this constant. We need to figure out that constant of the exponent. And in virtue of computing these things, we can get the finalized solution, okay? So how do we do that? How do we do that? How do we take our scaffold and start building our building or building our solution. What we could do is we could take this guy and we can throw it into that guy because this is like our map. It's like our schematic. It tells us how our solution is going to behave, right? How the motion is going to evolve. So we can plug this guy into here. So obviously you're thinking, okay, well, we need to figure out the derivatives. Um, or rather, you know what? This, this is so easy, the derivatives. I'm just going to plug it right in. Two derivatives, we get the same function. This guy, using the chain rule, comes down twice. So if we plug this in, we get a r squared e to the rt is equal to g over l a e to the rt, All right? Well, what we could do is we can cancel this, we can cancel that, we can cancel that, we can cancel that. And what that does is our schematic gives us some information for filling in the details, how to build our solution in essence. So we get r squared is equal to g over l. And then if we take the square root, we get plus minus root g over l. So we filled in one unknown for our assumed solution. We're trying to make this obey our schematic, our blueprint. So what we can say is, if we want a generalized solution, the name of the game in ODEs is to say, okay, um, we got this assumed solution, we got these eigenvectors, which are the positive and negative root g over l exponent terms. We're going to take a superposition of them. We're going to say that we want to span the solution set, the solution space of all solutions such that we can I'll allow the solution to represent any possible solution or any possible path this object can evolve into. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to say um, the generalized solution is a superposition of our eigenvectors. Now, if this terms confuse you. If you've never taken linear algebra, don't know what I'm talking about, relax. You don't have to understand that to be able to get this. But we have to take, we have to consider every possible solution. So our schematic is telling us that we might have a positive or negative exponent at the top, and we want to incorporate that into our solution. So that may be, you know, we want to take a constant times 
e to the positive root g over l times t plus another constant, another contribution from the other solution, right? Plus this to the negative g over l t. So that's our generalized solution. Looks nice. So at this point, we sort of have the walls up. We know what the solution generally looks like. Now we want to fill in the finer details, right? We want to take some extra information, our initial conditions, to define these guys, okay? And then we get our final solution, our final product, our final building, in essence. How do we do that? Well, we're going to need to apply these guys, okay? So in order to do that, and I'm just checking if I put this in correctly, I did. We're going to need to take a derivative, right? We're going to need to apply that. I'm going to represent this with a, like this. So the derivative is easy. Just this guy pops down, we get the same function. That's what we've been talking about all this time, right? So we get a root g over l, e to the root g over lt, plus b, the derivative of this, chain rule pops that guy down, we get a negative. We're all get rid of this positive, we get the negative. We get the root g over l, and the same function. Bam. So now let's apply our initial conditions and finalize the solution. So first one we're going to use is this. So we know that y prime of 0 equals 0. And if we plug 0 in for t, we get a root g over l minus b root g over l. So guess what? These guys can cancel. And we find that A is equal to B. Nice, we're making progress. We got another term here. We're, you know, we're putting in a garden in our building, sort of, to work with our metaphor here. Next, what we want to do, we want to finalize this guy. We want to set it up so we can sell it, so we can use it, so it's practical, so it's awesome, right? So the last thing we want to do is figure out what A and B are equal to, right? And the way in which we do that is using our last initial condition, right? So this guy with this, that's like our blueprint, that's what guides us to the final product. Let's make use of it. It has to conform to these in essence. So, y sub zero is L over two. We take this guy, we're gonna put zero in there, which means e to the zero is one. We just get A plus B. Well, B is A, so this is equal to 2A. Well, what does that mean? We take the 2 over here, that means A is equal to um, L over 4, right? So I'm going to summarize that up here. I'm going to say A is equal to B is equal to L over 4. Good job, guys. We're almost done. We're almost done. With all that work. Erecting this solution, trying to restrict it to obey our schematic, all the information we have, and now what we can do is plug all the information in, get our final solution, and wrap this guy up. So let's do that. Let's do it. So y sub t just becomes let's plug it in, in here, man. So we get um, L over 4 e to the root g over lt plus l over 4 e to the negative root g over l times t. Bam! That's our, our final solution. But we look at this and say, you know, our building is not super cool. We can make it look even better and it can make our lives easier, right? Make it, the house more efficient. Make it more efficient. So what we can do is we can say, okay, check it out, guys. I'm gonna take this L over four, I'm gonna pop it out, and I'm gonna say we're gonna have e to the root g over lt plus e to the negative root g over lt. In essence, I'm trying to make this look pretty, make it easier to use, and uh, come up with the best expression of our final solution. And that's, that's what I'm doing, okay? So we see this guy and we say, okay, that term there looks very, 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 very familiar. What is that guy? Where did it come from? That guy looks like something. It's 
actually known as the kosh. The kosh. Let's take the kosh. So what is that defined as? Well, we saw maybe in algebra one, algebra two, where we saw this, that the kosh is defined as e to the x plus e to the negative x over two. We're saying, hey, hey buddy, man, I don't have this. Okay, we're missing the two. Let's take this, multiply by two, bam. So what we can do is, we can say this is equal to two kosh of what's inside, right? So what we end up with, after we plug that in, the two is gonna cancel with the four to get us L over two. We basically get L over two. Kosh root G over LT. And that's a, a better end product, it's a better solution, easier to work with. If this was a house, you'd be able to sell it, you'd be able to use it, it would be efficient. That's what we want to stick with. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, let's get rid of all this junk and write our beautiful solution that we worked so hard to get. So y sub t is equal to L over two kosh root g over L t, okay? So that's the solution. Now, if you watch any of my other videos, you probably know what I say is, hey guys, don't just follow it blindly. Get a solution, question it. Does this make sense? Is this what I expected to do? Does it jive well with my intuition? Does it match up with what's in reality? Because we want our solutions to converge upon reality. We don't do physics to do physics. We do physics to understand the world, to take that information, do something practical, maybe manipulate it to do some kind of function, to do something awesome, and to better serve life and the universe in general, right? So when we question this, we say, gosh, exponential terms. Well, guess what? Before we started the problem, we said, hey, when this guy falls, we're gonna have more mass under the origin. That more mass is gonna have more force of gravity that's gonna pull us down further. We are expecting an exponential solution. So this kosh makes sense. As it falls, it's going to be like, it's gonna to start to accelerate more. That's what this guy is telling us. That jives well with our intuition. And uh, from that standpoint, we have successfully tracked the motion of this rope using some Lagrange mechanics. And as you saw, um, I gave you a recipe you can follow. That's an infallible recipe. You can apply it to any problem in Lagrange mechanics you encounter. However, you want to think through the steps. Don't blindly trust what somebody else is giving you. Think critically. You are a smart individual. You are meant to use the mind that you were given, right? It can do wonderful things. Trust it. Confide in it. Confide in your intuition, what you can provide, what you can produce more than what somebody else gives you. Because you can do wonderful things if you apply that mind, if you apply what you know, get stuff done, crush whatever problem you have in life, and uh, you know, live your dreams, really. So that's it. That's the problem. I wanted to present to you. You have successfully completed quiz number two in my Udemy course. Um, if you have not checked that out, feel free to check that out. I have a pretty nice trailer on my, um, on my page, which you can check out. This is the logo for it uh, right there. Um, you know what? If you wanna dive more into this, if you wanna learn more, if you wanna take this and maybe develop some simulations regarding it, Enroll in my course. I'd love to work with you guys. I'd love to spend as much time as possible. I got a nice Q&A section. Uh, you got any questions either on this, any other videos in my, uh, on my YouTube, or even the course in general, send me an email. I'd love to connect with you, talk with you, discuss anything. Discuss uh, you know, physics, life, the universe, and everything. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for more videos.